This podcast is a production of Open Pediatrics, a free online resource for health professionals' education. Visit openpediatrics.org for more. Welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum on Open Pediatrics. This is our podcast series. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Professor at Harvard Medical School. We are very pleased to have with us today Dr. Christina Vanderplum. Dr. Vanderplum is co-director of the Stroke and Cerebrovascular Center, the medical director of the Cardiac Antithrombosis Management and Monitoring Program, and medical director of the Ventricular Assist Device Program at Boston Children's Hospital. She is also assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Christina, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here today. Christina, you know from our work together in the ICU that it seems, at least for your ICU colleagues, that the things that we fear for our patients on an extracorporeal circuit, hemorrhage or thrombosis, is becoming more of a challenge as time has gone on to adequately monitor anticoagulation and assure ourselves that we've hit the mark of where we want to be. It feels like more of a gray box to me in my third decade of practice. You've been very helpful to me as a consultant and now a colleague in our program, but how do you respond to that? Where do we pick up this story uh, as you see it as an expert in the field? I think you're absolutely correct. And I think in many ways we become a victim of our own success that we have, and I dare say not that we've mastered mechanical circulatory support, but we've become very efficient at at imploring it very early on, um, getting patients cannulated quickly, and getting ever more complex patients that in the past we might've been hesitant about even considering to offer that therapy, but now we are are diving in. And I think because of a combination of more complex patient selection, our ability to now support patients adequately, you know, providing adequate cardiac output, providing adequate oxygenation and unloading, and the duration of support is now extending beyond a few days to a few weeks, and in some cases, are now extending into months. And it's just a matter of time before we start to observe some of the phenomena that, you know, early on we used to see very, very quickly of thrombotic events in the circuit or thrombotic events in the digits of patients' fingers and toes. And now we're starting to see that later on. But I think one thing that I think has shifted at least my attention is not so much thinking about just the, are we adequately supporting their cardiac function? Are we adequately um, providing ventilatory support and oxygenation and all of that associated with VA ECMO or even VV ECMO? But are we actually looking at the, the endothelial system? Because that is something that impacts all of our organ function. And when we talk about patients who are dying of multi-organ failure, really what we're saying is they're dying because their endothelial function is dysregulated to a degree that we do not have a therapeutic intervention that's going to fix it. And ECMO is not going to fix endothelial dysfunction. And that's, I think, the crux of finding the solution to having patients succeed on these types of therapies. Well, Dr. Vanderplum, if there's one thing that this horrific SARS-CoV epidemic has taught us, it is that, as opposed to other viral disorders, SARS-CoV-2 certainly attacks the endothelium like nothing we've seen before, making the management of these patients with ARDS so difficult. But in the pediatric patient, how do we get our hands around the developmental hemostasis aspects of um, you know, the developing human, and how should we begin to think about, really, the endothelium in a way that we haven't been before? So in my different roles um, in mechanical circulatory support, and I think early on um, in my role as, as um, a physician looking at how we were going to support children on mechanical support using ventricular assist devices, we realized really quickly that, you know, you cause a tremendous amount of disruption of the endothelium, of the myocardium, of, of the vasculature when you start to instrument patients with PIC lines, with arterial lines. And most notably, when you start putting large cannulas in to provide circulatory support. And the body has a natural response that it's developed to preserve blood within the vascular system, and that's hemostasis. And we have hemostasis because it's part of this reparative process for wound healing, which consists of kind of different stages where, you know, the goal of hemostasis is to stop all bleeding. And the way that the body does this is 
it develops inflammation and inflammatory cells such as white blood cells come to clean up the site that's been disrupted, the endothelium that's been disrupted, and it comes with neutrophils and then macrophages. And following this, it then tries to rebuild the void. And in the, the most acute stage, it rebuilds the void with the formation of clot. And we see this all the time when you put a, a line into a vessel that, you know, you could develop clot right at the site of insertion of that line. But then where the line potentially interacts with other parts of the endothelium, it starts to then create um, more nidises for clot formation. And finally, the body then tries to remodel and rebuild around that site of tissue damage. And you always get some residual fibrosis and scarring. And so this is this historical or this physiologic process that has gone on in all humans since the dawn of time. But I think what we fail to appreciate is that in children that they have a very different hemostatic system, which is what you alluded to, this developmental hemostasis, such that in fetal life, your hemostatic system is changed and altered in such a fashion that in many ways you're almost more prone to bleeding. Well, as you go older and throughout life, you have a tendency towards more clotting. And that's not necessarily just because of how your clotting factors are developed, but of all the other factors that conspire against you, such as hypertension, cardiovascular disease. But acknowledging those differences um, that we know physiologically happens, we don't necessarily acknowledge those differences when we're treating patients in terms of antithrombotic therapies. And historically, we've applied the same strategies to a one-day-old as we do to an 80-year-old. The same um, medications, the same therapeutic targets, the same monitoring strategies. And so it's no surprise that the outcomes for these populations are vastly different, which is what I think needs to be the focus of moving forward in terms of identifying new strategies for antithrombosis and really trying to shift the tides in terms of bleeding and thrombotic complications by really looking at children vastly different than we have historically as compared to adults. Dr. Vanderplum, that's a good reminder for all of us of the developmental differences uh, across the age spectrum. So let's go to it on infants and children. How should we be thinking differently about hemostasis, anticoagulation in infants and children, especially in the ICU environment where they're ill and they're dynamically evolving their illness? I think that's a great question. And, and I think the first step is just realizing that there is a difference and acknowledging that the hemostatic system, hematological system is so closely intertwined um, with all of the other organ systems. You know, we so often talk about, you know, how is his renal function today? And we use numbers like BUN and creatinine as just objective markers of good and bad. We talk about pulmonary function, cardiac function, but we rarely ever say, well, how is the hematological function today? Um, we all know that there is a variety of different variables that go into this. You know, what's your red blood cell count? Are you anemic or are you polycythemic? And both of those are going to tell you so much about how you need to treat the patient and as surrogate markers of, are you getting adequate oxygenation or are, is your function or cardiac function going to be impaired by this? your white blood cell count, is it high or is it low? And both of those could tell you so much about the overall health of the patient. But there's so many other factors beyond the, just those two cell counts that can tell you so much about the tendency of the patient to potentially bleed or clot at any given time. And I think one of the most important variables that we don't necessarily always you know, add into our equation is what I call the bedside nurse assessment. And you go to the bedside and you ask the nurse, is this patient more bleedy or clotty today? And he or she will very quickly give you a very accurate assessment of what your coagulation profile will likely confirm, saying my patient is oozing from all of their, their chest tube sites, their arterial line sites. They have a lot of mucosal bleeding. They have blood when I suction from the ET tube. They have some blood in their sump right now, and they have quite a bit of bruising in petechia. And you say, that patient appears to have more of a clinical profile that is at higher risk of bleeding. Regardless of what your coagulation profiles or your lab tells you, that patient is clinically more at risk of bleeding versus the patient in whom the nurse says, you know what, I've just had to um, TPA the line multiple times because it's clotted off. We're getting a lot of large clots coming out of the chest tubes or the chest tubes are completely clotted off. Everything is absolutely dry. There is no blood from any site. 
and skin integrity looks wonderful. And then you get, you know, coagulation labs on those patients. And generally speaking, those coagulation labs would once again reassert what the clinical observation is. But I think rarely when we get to the hematological system on our review of systems, do we actually ask those questions. And as a result, we come up with kind of a standard plan each day saying this patient is on aspirin and or heparin. And our therapeutic goal is a PTT of 60 to 80, check next, next one. But when we get to the renal system, we'll always say, well, the patient does appear to be a little bit more edematous. The creatinine is down. The BUN is up. But I think we should make the fluid balance negative by 100 today. But if we had that same approach to the hemostatic system, I think we would actually decrease the risk of bleeding and clotting irrespective of what strategies or agents we're using just because we're thinking about it as a fluid and dynamic system, not one that is static from day to day. Dr. Vanderbloom, um, even though I've known you for many years, um, you're getting me to rethink my approach to the bedside. Take us further now. Let's get more granular. Um, and as you know, um, we're calling you up the unit all the time now for our patients on mechanical support. What's in our armamentarium right now? What should we be thinking about? What, what's, your, what's your sequence of what you're going to introduce for anticoagulation in this context, mechanical support? So I think for, for many years, we've had kind of the top agents used, which has been unfractionated heparin, which has garnered a lot of use over the years, primarily in the world of cardiology and cardiac surgery as well as in dialysis. There are agents such as low molecular weight heparin, subcutaneous injections that are delivered, could be once or twice a day, of which fondoparinox, uh, lobinox are part of that family. And then there's oral agents of which the direct oral um, anticoagulants such as dabigatrin, apixaban, uh, and rivaroxaban are upon the horizon um, with you know, standard of, of care use in adults, but emerging use in, in pediatrics. And I think when we look to the ICU setting, the primary agent that's been used for decades has been unfractionated heparin. And for those who have used the agent frequently, acknowledge the challenges of its use, primarily in pediatrics. And that relates to many of the factors of developmental hemostasis that I discussed earlier, that there's physiological changes and differences in some of the clotting factors, of which antithrombin-3 is one of them in which children have physiologically lower levels of antithrombin and qualitatively different, such that it doesn't bind with heparin as strongly. And because of the fact that heparin requires antithrombin to exert its effect, heparin has a much more variable impact in the the pediatric population, most notably those less than one year of age who have more variable and lower levels of antithrombin. So I've always kind of approached unfractionated heparin as what I call the frenemy. And for those not familiar with that term, it's an enemy disguised as a friend um, or a person with whom you must be friendly despite a dislike or rivalry. And I say it because to me, unfractionated heparin has multitude of factors that don't make it an ideal choice um, for use in pediatrics but we've just come to accept that that's what it is. And so I'll quickly kind of go through some of the reasons I don't like heparin and how we can kind of go around and use those weaknesses to at least acknowledge them and find solutions. So first, I think heparin has coasted on a reputation. The WHO named it one of the required medications, and that was primarily for use in adults. And once again, it has a utility and a role there, but we have to acknowledge that children are different. It's unreliable. The term unfractionated denotes that it has not been fractionated, which means that every vial contains a variable amount of the 18 polysaccharide unit that exerts its primary effect. And because of that, you will see wide variations in kind of your your monitoring, be it an anti a level or heparin activity level or PTT, based on what vial of preparation you're using. There's also changes in the potency just from batches. And from year to year, we've seen changes in potency of heparin depending on where we get it. I think one of the main things is that it's dependent on others to get the job done. It needs antithrombin to potentiate its activity 
by, by upwards of a hundredfold. And this is a huge problem in children who already have physiologically low levels of antithrombin and they, they need to have low levels of antithrombin. For years, we used to actually administer antithrombin to children to potentiate the activity of heparin, but now there is already established and much more emerging data that shows that antithrombin itself is an anti-angiogenic protein. It has low levels because it prevents angiogenesis. And at a time when children are developing and you need angiogenesis, providing an agent that actually suppresses that down could be potentially causing more harm than good. It's also unpredictable and clingy. So heparin binds to anything that's positively charged, to plastics, to proteins. And as a result, it has a variable impact depending on how much artificial material you have placed in. And I think one of the main issues is that you can't really avoid it in a hospital setting. And so many times we have heparin running through lines and it creates a false sense of security that that line shouldn't have clotted because there was heparin going through it. Or we don't even acknowledge the amount of heparin that's being given to neonates because they have line heparin running in this line or the other line and they get boluses with a variety of different interventions. And all of this potentially increases the risk over time of developing heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is an immune-mediated um, thrombocytopenia, which I think is also underappreciated in pediatrics. So with all that said, um, early on, I kind of looked at, we have to have other alternative agents to heparin. And that's what kind of opened my eyes to the reality is that there are other agents. And um, I grew fond of the direct thrombin inhibitors as a class of drugs, and specifically bivalirudin, which is currently one of the main agents we use in ventricular assist device support. Well, Dr. Christina Vanderplum, you are hitting on something that I suspect colleagues throughout the world have experienced. And that is, I, I know many of us believe that in the last five, seven years or so, that the heparin preparations that we are receiving are increasingly unpredictable in their effect. And as you well know, there are several studies, including one in PCCM recently from our institution that looked at the traditional uh, clotting time, you know, heparin level, PT, PTT, ACTs, and candidly, nothing correlated with anything. Is, is that anecdotalism or has something happened to the manufacturer, uh, the reliability of the quality of the manufacturer of heparin in the last five to seven years? So your observations are accurate. And I think we noted this around 2015, um, that, you know, patients who had historically, you know, we, we start heparin in a neonate at 28 units per kilo and, a, and an older child at 20 units. And many of the neonates and young children were upwards of 48, 54 units. And we thought, well, this is a dramatic shift that can't be accounted for by just, you know, the physiologic properties of the patient. And Unbeknownst to us, um, the FDA actually provides announcements on a yearly basis of whether some of the drug's potencies will change. And most notably, they had put out a statement saying that the heparin potency had decreased by 10%. Now, subsequent to that, many other people put out smaller publications, more so anecdotal and single center reports stating that similar to what we had observed, that their mean or median dose of heparin use in, in different populations were increasing much more than 10%. But I think as, as a group, we have to acknowledge that potency of these drugs change. And if seven years ago, they put out a statement saying that it changed, and we just happened to see that, it means that it's probably happening more often than not. And so the idea that we are still clinging to dosing that was developed with a single potency at a single time point may not at all be applicable to what we are using in our children today. Among the many leadership positions you have here at Boston Children's Hospital, you're the medical director of the ventricular assist device program. And as you know, um, your critical care colleagues looked intriguingly at uh, what you were using for anticoagulation in that population. And you were speaking earlier about direct thrombin inhibitors. Tell us about bivalrudin. And of course, the story is somewhat known uh, in the ventricular uh, assist device field. But tell us about that. And then your thoughts of perhaps bringing that to the bedside for our extracorporeal membrane oxygenation pa patients. Yeah, so it was 
you know, around eight years ago that we had a string of patients who were supported on, at that time, the Berlin Heart XCOR, which is a paracorporeal VAD. Um, and one of the only FDA approved VADs that were commonly used for pediatric support as a bridge to transplant. And we were using a heparin-based regime and transitioning these patients either to Lovenox or to Warfarin. And that upwards of 50% of our patients over a few years ended up having ischemic strokes. And it was devastating. And the idea that our counseling families to do this life-saving therapy when their child needed it, but on the other hand, looked so well on the device and then would succumb to a debilitating neurological deficit that they would then have, regardless of whether they got a transplant or not, it was to me too much to bear. And so I thought I would not keep doing this or advising my families to do this if I wouldn't do it for my own child. And I looked um, at different centers and at different agents and truly just did a deep dive into all of the different intravenous anticoagulants that were out there. And bivalirudin stuck out as a specific agent that appeared to have had an established history of use as an alternative to heparin when there were concerns of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And so this non-heparinoid medication is what we call a direct thrombin inhibitor. And um, some of the properties that made it, to me, particularly advantageous to children is that it wasn't dependent upon antithrombin in any way, shape, or form. It had very linear pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, which then resulted in very predictable dose response curves, such that if you increased the dose by 10%, you would get almost a 10 point commensurate increase in your PTT or or your dilute thrombin time or whatever you're using to monitor the drug effect. The other effect that seemed very interesting to me is early on in the adult ventricular assist device use, they used to have problems with pump thrombosis. And one center was actually using bivalirudin as an alternative to TPA when you were having pump thrombosis. And that was just their standard approach. And if the pump had some evidence of hemolysis and thrombosis, they put them on a bival infusion for 24 to 48 hours, clear the hemolysis, which was a surrogate for pump thrombosis, and the patients would go on their way. And so I thought to myself, if you can use this anticoagulant to clear clot, why aren't we using it to prevent clot in such a highly thrombogenetic population? And so I created a protocol in 2017. And in our first five patients, we went from doing pump exchanges almost within the first two weeks, we used to do upwards of five pump exchanges to no pump exchanges. And a patient would be implanted and three to six months later would get a heart transplant on a single pump. The rate of stroke went down to zero. And because we were doing so few pump exchanges, the company actually reached out and said, what what are you guys doing? We used to send you guys so many pumps. And I explained our approach. And just by word of mouth, this approach then spread such that in 2019, we wrote a protocol and formalized a learning collaborative called ACTION, or Advanced Cardiac Therapies Improving Outcomes Network. And as part of this collaborative, one of the first initiatives was making bivalirudin the standard of care for Berlin Heart. And through the use of real-world data that we accumulated, the FDA then approved through post-market approval the use of bival as part of the Berlin Heart um, protocol for anticoagulation. And since that time, now bival is the standard of care and has reduced stroke um, across North America and Europe down to, as of uh, the most recent data, down to 11.6% from 30%. So we still have room to go but I think it's made a tremendous um, impact on on this patient population. Well, Christina, probably like all innovations and advances in the field, that was a wonderful story. It was driven by, you know, your personal experience watching these kids suffer, even though the, you know, the heart transplant went well, but they weren't doing well and you, you fixed the problem. You are now helping us. You are collaborating with your critical care colleagues to systematically introduce bivalrudin in certain ECMO patient populations. What are the lessons we have to learn from your experience with VAD as we do this in a methodical, responsible way? 
So I think one of the biggest lessons to take away from my experience with, with bival in the VAD population is that it's not just the agent. It's not that bivalirudin or direct thrombin inhibitors or whatever drug comes down the pipeline is the magical solution. It's truly the approach to how you institute and communicate and educate the people around you. We rely so much upon the expertise of the bedside nurse, of the person who's caring for the patient, of the parent who reports their observations and on the clinical exam of the patient. You know, I always tell the trainees that we are not anticoagulating to a goal. We are anticoagulating to the appearance of the patient and the appearance of the pump. And when you have mechanical support that's transparent and you can actually see clots form, then that's a window into their circulation that unlike any other type of condition, we have the ability to see what's happening in real time. And so utilize that. And we have to tailor our approach to antithrombosis with ECMO, with complex patients, with post-surgical patients, with pre-surgical patients in that same fashion. Just because you might not always have a window into their circulation, you have so many other markers that are going to tell us whether that patient is more prone to bleeding and clotting. Because as of today, we do not have any specific diagnostic laboratory test that's going to tell us that with any degree of certainty. We really, truly rely upon kind of the big picture. And that's how we have to move forward with these types of antithrombosis guidelines or protocols or approaches is really continue to be a clinician and a practitioner and not just somebody who's trying to follow an algorithm or a guide and trying to squeeze the patients into that guide, but rather have the patients direct us in terms of what they need, like truly doing patient-directed and patient-tailored therapy. We have the tools, we just have to use them appropriately to what the patients need. Christina, could you give the citation or where our colleagues around the world could find the results of your VAD network, your action network, and the guidelines that emerged from your collaboration? Absolutely. So if you go online um, and you look up www.actionlearningnetwork.org, you'll be directed to a site that has a ton of information for both practitioners and family as it relates to improving outcomes for these complex patients. Um, We have our bivalirudin um, protocols, as well as a multitude of other communication and education guidelines that are created with practitioners and providers across North America, Europe, and beyond. And one more time, would you mind repeating that for those who may have missed it the first time, the URL address? Yeah, it's www.actionlearningnetwork.org. Actionlearningnetwork.org. Perfect. Dr. Christina Vanderplum of Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, thank you for taking us through really what is such an important evolving science and remains um, a a real challenge um, at the bedside. And we thank you for all the work that you've done by bringing this to the VAD population first and now for helping your critical care colleagues at Boston Children's Hospital start to bring these principles to our extracorporeal membrane patients as well. Thank you so much. I was delighted to, to join the conversation. This has been a production of Open Pediatrics. Check out the description box to view the resources and journal articles referenced in this podcast. To hear more podcasts like this one, log on to openpediatrics.org.